Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in the series of Family Business Seminars as part of the Global Family Business Summit. I am delighted this afternoon that I've been joined by Guillermo Salazar from Houston in the States for a session all around managing power and the power dynamics in family businesses. So without further ado, Guillermo, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in Family Business United events. And uh, I think that this time we are going to go um, through some of the questions that eventually you will do by yourself or to yourself or to your own family if you are part of a family business, which is how do you manage power in family business? So I made a presentation here I would like to share with you. Uh, I'll try to go through the, the issues that uh, we have detected that are related with how families can control and keep controlling their ownership in order to pass this to the next generation. So when we talk about managing power, what we really are talking about is how do we don't lose the control of this power, especially in the moments that it's most sensitive for any family business, which is the succession process. So um, what we're going to do here is we are going to spend some time talking about four factors that are related with this capacity of controlling power. The first one is that we need to understand what's the real difference between authority and power, which are so, so in, in, in most of the cases, there are words that we use indistinctly. There is a huge difference between them. The other one is we're going to go through the difference between complexity and how does it evolve in every one of the stages of a family business and how that it affects the governance. The other one is the balancing points. How do we distribute the power in the business family? And the last one are the rules of the game. And anytime, Paul, you can uh, ask some question related with that. I'll try to make it uh, um, fluid enough to, to go through the concept. No, so we're ha happy to ask questions, Guillermo. And also I'd like to ask the audience if there's any questions that were prompted by your slides, if they pop them into the chat box, then I can make sure we cover off any of the, the challenges they have or the questions they have for us during the period. So um, we'll definitely make sure you get some questions, don't worry. Okay, so this one, the this, this first one, what's the difference between authority and power? We have to think that uh, the first society that created the real difference was the Roman society the Roman Empire in, the, in the, the moment of the creation of the empire, they decided that in order to distribute all of the ener energy that the society was creating as a creative society, as a destructive society, uh, was to uh, create a, a figure that they called the potestas, which was the legal decision-making capacity that a person could have in order to distribute this energy. But they also recognized that there were, they were people that they called the autoritas, which were the people with a social standing to issue opinions. It's what, what we call today an uh, influencer. An influencer in the society, and sometimes they could have more importance. In, 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 in some cases, they could beat the power itself. The authority was the most important thing that a person that would like to be a leader should have. And they recognize that in some cases, the leaders, the natural leaders could have both potestas and autoritas. But in some cases, leaders only have power, which was not enough. And in order to illustrate that this concept, I would like to uh, play a video of a, a, a movie I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you have already seen. It's Gladiator. It's, I can't believe this movie has 21 years old. And it was uh, uh, the history of, uh, of a uh, general of the Home Roman Empire that was uh, uh, accused of, of killing the, the Caesar. And the Caesar uh, was killed by his successor. The scene that we are going to see is when the, this general returns as a gladiator after beating all of the different stages a gladiator need to be in the, in the Coliseum. The Coliseum was the most important um, 
place to be if you really wanted to 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 gain what a gladiator was looking for that was liberty uh freedom uh they were all a slave and in if you win the, the battle the caesar will decide if you live or you die they have that power what we're going to see is what happened when this gladiator gains authority in order to gain this uh, freedom. One last question that the Roman uh, society has was the uh, who really have the, this uh, capacity of, of creating energy was the people of the society. They call it the majestas. And the majestas was, by the end of the day, the people who decide who will have the protestas and the authority. So um, I will play this, uh, this clip of the movie when we are going to see what happens when the gladiator wins the battle in the, in the Coliseum and the new Caesar, who has the power, comes to uh, congratulate him. So I will stop here and I will call this one. Okay, here we go. Yeah, but the sound's not playing. You still have sound? No? No. Okay. Nice. Oh, yes, Can we you... do now. Uh, do you have it now? Yes. Nice. Okay, sorry for that. Hey, this well deserves. Still think it's ever been a gladiator's match. For this young man, he insists you are Hector Recon. Such Hercules. Why doesn't the hero reveal himself and tell us all your real name? You do have a name. My name is Gladiator. How dare you show your back to me? Slave! Remove your helmet and tell me your name. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix Legions, loyal servant to the true emperor, Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, Husband to a murdered wife. I will have my vengeance, and this life will be next. And that's it. That's the, the situation that we can see uh, here that show us that when you have the authority, you can defeat the power. And that shows us that what is most important in managing the business that you are trying to lead is that you need the authority. And our concern as family business owners 
is that the next generation need to develop their own sense of authority, not power because they will have power. We will give them power. We will give them the, the keys of the business to lead it. But what we need them is to create the capacity of this authority that is something that they have to create by themselves. The only way to create authority is fighting in the exile where was Maximus and creating your own prestige and be confident and face the power and create this sense of authority. Only then the majestas, the people, the business, the family is going to recognize what you are really having. So that's what is the most important thing in managing power, understanding that for the next generation, we have to create the condition that the next generation gains their own uh, um, sense of authority. Guillermo, yeah, how, how in terms of your experience then does that balance with the responsibility and then also authority to, to make decisions, but having the responsibility to make those decisions? There's a fine line, isn't there, in terms of a next mm -hmm. gen having authority and then actually being allowed. So, so, so how does that balance play out for you? Well, yeah, um, it's, a, it's a matter of creating, it's a, it's a path that the next generation have to, to, to go through. And when, when you have uh, a clear sense of leadership, if you are a member of the next generation, you know that your time will come when the system will allow you to be the leader that the system is expecting from you. So there is a balance, yes, but you will have to create that balance. Uh, you will have, as I mentioned before, you will have power in some cases, but you have to demonstrate to yourself and to the rest of the system that you are the person that the, the, they are expecting. And how do you do that? You, usually you, you do that in, in three steps, three different steps. You only, you, at the beginning, you have a, a, a kind of, um, of credit that the system gives you because you are a member of a, of a family uh, you are supposed to have studies, uh, you have maybe a, a, a degree that, 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 that led you uh, uh, be in the, in, the, in the position that you are, uh, and they, they give you credit. Maybe this person is something that we, we are looking for. Mm -hmm. Then the second step is when you develop your own day-to-day -day performance and you solve the situations that usually you are expect to do in the, in the charge that you are, you are doing, but the third and the most important one is in a situation of an emergency, something that happens that nobody is, uh, is expecting that happens. And this particular person solves the situation. Then is when the system says, this is the man or the woman, the woman that we need. This is the leader that we need. But, but it's a process. It's a process that you, you, you have to create by yourself. And, and we, as, as, as parents of the next generation, we have to help them to create these situations. We have to let them uh, the room necessary to uh, develop this uh, capacity of authority. And that's the most important part of, of succeeding a, a family business. Do you think, given the, given the context of where we're in, Guillermo, sort of two years into pandemic and gl uh, global kind of issues in terms of managing and, and families have come back together. Do you think the last 12, 18 months, then there have been more opportunities for the next generation to really demonstrate their ability than they would Absolutely. normally have had? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those in every crisis, we have always the opportunity to reinforce the, the development of the leadership. And we, what we have witnessed is basically two situations in the, with the clients we, we, we working with. The first one is that if there is not a definition of the leadership, this crisis has obliged the, the system to define it. And in those cases, you have to redefine what is, what is not working. Yeah. And, and, and if you can do that, you will, you will have the, the new leadership emerging in a family business. And the other case is that this crisis, if the leadership has strong enough structures to support it, it got uh, reinforced with this crisis and this situation. And the leadership was reaffirmed in, 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 in all of these months that we've been living through. So, so yes, the crisis helped even to define or redefine the leadership in family businesses. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'll keep on going with this uh, presentation. If 
to allow me to go through the next uh, concept, which is complexity and governance, uh, which is, is a concept that uh, is related with the evolution of the family business. Um, when we think in terms of ownership, and we know that basically we have three stages when, when we think about the family business, at least in the, in the first one, which is the first one is controlling ownership, then the sibling partnership, and then the cousins consortium. And if we think about uh, the possible options that the family business has in order to go through the evolution of the complexity, we will see that there's always an option to go to the go back to the road of simplicity by pruning the tree, which is an expression that means that we can solve um, the distribution of the ownership among different owners and try to simplify the ownership and going back in different stages. And the other one is the road to the complexity, which is the one that is related with several owners. And in those cases, we will see an increase in the complexity of the system. A complexity is defined by the numbers of elements and the interactions that they have. So if they are this, the, the, the owners are deciding to go through the complexity uh, way, you will see that there is a phrase uh, quoted by uh, Al Capone who said, you can get farther with a smile and a gun than with a smile alone. So uh, when we apply that uh, quote to how can we govern uh, a complexity in order to adapt the evolution of the concepts of governance and structure, you will see that in some cases, we will need command. You will need a leader, someone with the gun, uh, the one that decides, the one that leads, and the one that has all the answers to the questions. And in some cases, you will need structure. You will, you will need smile. You will need to negotiate with the rest of the owners because there are other uh, armed people in the room. So uh, when you think about the controlling owner stage, you will see that you, you have a, a, a big gun. And then when you see the sibling partnership, you will see that uh, the gun is smaller, but everyone has a gun. And when you go to the consume, uh, Cousin Consortium, you will see that this, the, the, the guns are really small, uh, the, the, the caliber 22, uh, but everybody is armed, everybody has a gun, and you have a lot of people with guns in the room. So you need to, create situations and philosophy of working that tend to uh, um, uh, justify the, the creation of the governance structure that you need, because with only one leader, you cannot go through uh, any situation that you need to control. So most of the assistants are adapted to in the controlling owner uh, stage to autocracy where you'll find that there is only one person doing all of the decisions and he or she doesn't need to uh, um, uh, ask anyone about what he decides or she decides. It's the, the autocracy that we see in, in most of these stages. Then the next step, if we have a, um, a successful uh, succession, we will see that the consensus is the best way to create a decision model among siblings. And this is a special condition for siblings. All of us who have siblings knows that we can create the, the, the room for debating, fighting, and, and, and contenting all of the people almost in the same hour of, of meeting. So this consensus is something that it's very related with the nature of the sibling relationship. And it's better than voting or creating a sense of democracy, which is the last stage. Uh, when we have the consortium, the, the cousin consortium, uh, because of the complexity, because of the number of elements, we will see that creating a consensus, it's harder than in the, in the sibling stage. Uh, most of the people that are related in a decision room uh, doesn't have the kind of relationship that you could have with a sibling. Uh, so the, the cousins uh, tend to behave in a more professional way than in the consortium, uh, that in the, in the sibling stage, 
So the best way to create a decision model is with the democracy um, concepts of representativeness, of elections, of uh, institutions, everything that is more related to a more professionalized uh, uh, way to understand the governance. So this is usually the way that we see the, the evolution of how do we create the structure for, uh, uh, for, to supporting the specific complexity. What we don't recommend is that if you don't have the necessary complexity, you don't have to create the structure that you don't need. So if you are in a, a controlling owner stage, maybe creating a board is something that you can start to think in the last part of this stage. Maybe you don't need that at the beginning because you don't, I mean, the, the business need you, don't, 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 doesn't need any, any other structure. So keep, it simple, keep it simple and don't overcomplicate it at the, at the earlier stages because you don't need all the Absolutely. extra dimensions, yeah? Absolutely, you have to keep it simple. On the other hand, if you have the uh, co uh, costing consortium, don't try to do it with only one leader trying to lead all of the situations that they are facing. You need to create a structure because otherwise it, it, it will collapse as a structure with the, with the governance. So that's basically what we do when we try to understand the um, complexity and the continuity of the business. Um, the other uh, element of understanding the power in, in family business is the balancing points. And that's when we call uh, the concept of the three circle model. Of course, everybody here knows what this model is about. Uh, we will see that uh, the way that we uh, conceptualize the system is understanding that every circle has its own identity, but at the same time, they share an identity as a system. And the first balance point that will help us to simplify this complexity is the business balance point. So um, understanding that there must to be an institution that can help us to understand what's the, what, what the ownership wants, what the business wants, and how do we equilibrate everyone who is talking about the same situation, the same reality, we will find this institution uh, is the one that we call the board. And this balance point, which is the board of direction, has precisely these kind of functions that help us to create the balancing point between the two circles. The first one is managing uh, shareholders investment. Um, they have to define the business strategy. They have to design uh, how they can design the, its own organizational structure and frequency of meeting. Mm -hmm. um, they determine the resource allocation for firm management. And the most important of all, which is hiring, evaluating, supervising, and firing the CEO of the business. This is what a balance point do. And when we have a, a, a functional board that can understand what are the needs of the ownership and the needs of the business and can create the situation that uh, lead the, the, the thinking of what's the best for the system, you will have a board that works in the, in the balance point concept. So this is, this is the one that we understand. Um, moving forward in the, oh, and there are others, uh, other functions that are, are, are established by, by the laws. Uh, on the other hand, we will have the balance point of the governance of the, of the family. But before that, uh, every um, system of, of governance in a business uh, uh, of private capital, independent of if this is a, a family business or not family business, we will have this uh, um, uh, shareholders assembly going uh, to decide over the board of directors and the board of director over the CEO. And then we will have the different uh, positions of management. Uh, this is how the structure of the governance of the family firm usually uh, works. Then uh, the balancing point for the family side, we will have then uh, looking for an institution that can help us to understand what the needs of the family and what the need of the ownership. And once we have that institution created, 
we will define it as the family council, which will be the family balancing point as an institution which uh, will try to, to, to perform these functions that is basically uh, focused on planning the succession in providing education and development opportunity for family members. Um, in some cases, it can mediate uh, conflicts between family members. Uh, it provides training and informing present and future family shareholders. It supports the family protocol or family charter development and oversees its updating and application. Uh, it also uh, provides study and understanding of family culture and values. And basically, uh, uh, they uh, can help us to uh, oversee a good relationship. Uh, uh, the, the, the climate, the, the, the way that we understand uh, how good communication qualify, as well as harmony and, and unity in the family. We can also, from the family council, develop structures, policies, and procedures in accordance to the family needs, uh, prepare the next generation to be responsible owners, uh, attempt to include uh, family pores. In some cases, we can create this uh, special support for endeavors and scholarships and, and laws or, or aids to family members. Yeah. Um, it can help, help us to coordinate the family's philanthropic activity and play the role of guardian of the family legacy. And finally, what the, our real family council do uh, does is, is guide transcendental decisions regarding the family's patrimony. It's basically what we understand on what are the functions of the of this balancing point of family and ownership. So, as an structure, it's more simple than the balancing point of the business. We will have. Uh, a de facto um, um, institution that controls different committees of, of working on different issues that the family will need. We can have a junior committee or, or three, uh, third generation committee or, or, of causing committees, uh, the family office, the family assembly, or a family foundation, anything that the family needs to develop a governance in all of the issues that are not related specifically with the, with the business, uh, we can control them from the family council. So in terms of understanding uh, the concept of the balancing point, we will see that our system is always uh, in balance if we foresee the importance of the ownership and its role in the, in the balancing of the business and the family. So, when we have this balanced system, we will see that in the um, structure of the governance, we can create a, a border that separates and at the same time, it coordinates all of the decision-making process between the family and the business. And in some cases, we can connect the family council with the board of directors. In other cases, we can connect the family council with the shareholders assembly. And in other cases, you can have one family council in the middle of different business or investments that depends on the decision of the, of the family that sends the information to the board that decides the strategy of the business or the investment. But basically this um, structure help us to create uh, the focus on the conversations that we need to have, uh, depending on what we want to do, if this is something related with the family or is something related with the investment or the uh, business that we are talking about. So, I guess Guillermo, as a family or a family member, seeing a structure like that and having that presented to you as maybe a next generation member that's not involved in the family, just trying to understand your role as a family member um, in the structure of how it reports into the family council or how you interact with the, 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 the business. This kind of clearly defines that, doesn't it? So it's, it's, it's useful just as a document, just so you can understand where you sit as an individual within the whole structure of the family and the business, because you've often got, and, and, and that's a simple person that's not involved. If you're a family member that's a shareholder, 
and has a board of director role, then just understanding where you sit and how you how you talk to yourself effectively can help clarify some of those decision making processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, that that's what usually happens when you you start to understand what your real role in this structure, you will find your own place. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that because you are a member of the family, you have a seat in the board of directors because this is your birth right. Au contraire, <laughs> what you need to yeah. do is understand that you are a member of the family that maybe you will be uh, an owner and maybe you will have the power to decide who has to be seated in the board. So um, every time that, that, that we think about what's my, my own role in all of this structure, uh, and, and if I am sincere on what I want to do with my own um, uh, future ownership, I will find the right place for what I want to do with my life. So in some cases, we, we can keep on the family council. Uh, we can be part of a, one of the committees that works for the family business. We, yeah. You can be part of, the, uh, of one of the investment groups of the family uh, office, for example. Uh, but you don't have to be always in the board. This is something that uh, probably if you are good enough to create value, to uh, decide the strategy of the business, maybe the owners can help you to see if you will be a good member of the board or not. It will, it will depend on the owners. Yeah, and I guess the other thing looking at the screen and the slide it's almost giving you an opportunity to define role, potential roles down the line for a next generation member to step into. So they might take a role on the family assembly or the family foundation, or as an extra on the junior committee, or they may be a manager in the business, but it gives you an opportunity to see what the entry points may be for you as an individual at different stages of your career too. So it's, it's got a really broad application, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's, that's something that we have to define prior to any attempt to, to, to be part of this business. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's one of the policies that you usually um, try to define in the, in the family charter. Um, yes, it, it's, in fact, I will say that that's a classic in the family business uh, uh, charter reduction uh, discussion. Um, and, and, and most of the family that cannot define that policy I can see that they, they, they confuse uh, the concept of what a family needs and what the business needs. And that's what the balancing point tries to make, to do for the system. Try to put what, what you really need in order to uh, keep the power and the control of even either your family or the business. So when you put everything in their, their, their right place, things that start to make sense to you when you try to uh, uh, commit members of the family with this, uh, with the business. It's a bit like the Jim Collins book, isn't it? Where he talks about having the right people on the bus, but then actually having the right people in the right seats on the bus. And you could take that bus, it could be the family council, it could be the board of directors, but it's about having the right people in the right places at the right time to drive forward the agenda that you have. Yes, yes, absolutely. And as, as we mentioned before, this, this example that we are staring right now, for example, this one, is a, it's a complexity level, high complexity level. This, this one, we can see that we have most of, of anything that the family need in, mm. in order to, 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 to create this control of the power. But in some cases, you don't need that much structure, especially from the side of the, of the family. And maybe a family council, could be enough. Uh, they 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 can move from the governance to a more um, a operative uh, function and 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 be more uh, hands on 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 the on a day to day uh, decision making for the needs of the family. So in those cases, you can have a family council that is very active, and you can invite most of the of the members that would be uh, or would like to be involved. On, on, on the on the family side, so um, depending on, on what you are looking for or, or what the sense of ownership you want to create, you will see that in some cases maybe the family council can have the answer 
too much of the expectations of the family members that, that would like to get involved in somehow, in some way with the business system. So yes, I think that there, there, you can find the right people for the right place. Okay. One, one other question then, in terms of the work that you do with family firms, you talked about the, the family balancing point and the business balancing point. Which one do families struggle with most, do you think? Uh, I would say both. <laughs> in some <laughs> cases, you will, um, it depends on the complexity of the family. Mm -hmm. Again, if you are a family that it's evolving from first to second generation, you will see that creating the board is something that is a new concept. Uh, because as we mentioned before, the, in the ownership stage, the, the, the sole proprietor, proprietor uh, ownership stage, um, there is a, 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 a mindset in the system that says that only one is the one who decides. But when you move to the new concept of now we have to think in a new mindset, which is yeah we are a collectiveness that have to decide and then we have to create a board we we can justify the structure of a collectiveness that will take the decision that be in a, in a in a in a prior stage only was made for one person yeah most of the family uh, really have to struggle with that because it's not easy to create the the, the change of 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 state of mind once you have the second to third generation, you already have the culture of, 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 of many making decisions on the, for the same objectives. So I would say that in, in those cases, uh, struggling with the, with the board, it's, it's more complicated. But in other cases, you will see that creating a family council and giving power on the family side it's something that it's always related with a leader on the on the board side of the business, uh, with 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 generosity, with intelligence, and with uh, courageousness enough to create a, another head of power close to him, which is something that he is giving to the family. So in those cases, there are leaders that agreed on doing that others think that this is something that um, the family doesn't need because they have them so you will see that in every case depending of the of the stage of evolution depending on the complexity of the structure you will you will find more difficult to implement one or other side yeah okay that makes sense but I guess you're looking at people to change their behaviours over time too. So you're going from a, 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 an entrepreneurial startup, where, as you say, he makes all the decisions or she makes all the decisions into an environment where actually it's, it's a collaborative decision-making process and somebody individually doesn't actually have the influence potentially to make those decisions alone. So it's a change in the whole behavioural mindset behind the individuals on the board as opposed to the, the, the prior stage. So there's a lot of change going on, which I guess people find it difficult sometimes to, to adapt to. Yeah, and that's why, according to the statistics, uh, most of the family business fail on the on, on passing the, fir the first or the second generation. Uh, the, the, the percentage of failing is higher in this pass of stages than in the others. Usually, I know that this is something that we are always reviewing, but but based on on the bibliography and most of of the of the. Uh, experience I have, I can see that that's true. I mean, passing from the first to the second generation is, is a real challenge for a family. But once you have the culture of, 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 uh, of uh, diversity, of uh, representation, of uh, uh, collective interest, it's easier to pass to the next generation because of, of that model. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so um, I will move ahead with the last uh, of the elements I wanted to talk about on managing power, which is the rules of the game. So in order to perform uh, um, management of power in a family business, we need rules. The rules always exist. Uh, but if we are um, intelligent enough to write down all of those rules and to talk about the rules that we don't agree as a as a group 
we can find that we can uh, create a um, frame of developing, grow, and create a business with rules that we can follow. So one of the most important uh, documents that we create when we try to um, define those rules is what we call the family protocol or the family charter. But the concept that we work with is not about the document itself. It's about the process of working together, of having the conversations, of creating a, a sense of belongingness among all of the members that make part of this process. And it allows us as a family to face the future of this ownership of this patrimony in a way that we can call orderly and collaborative. Uh, that's the way that we understand what a family charter or family protocol should do. Uh, again, it's not about the business, it's not about the, the, the document itself. It's about the process and, and how we experience those conversations as a family uh, that are looking for a definition of the future. Every family charter, every family protocol in somehow, in some way, is always thinking about the future and how can we define those rules? How can we uh, foresee these situations that we can face in, in this path to the future and for those elements that we cannot foresee today because it's very hard to protocolize the future uh, we have to create the conditions of a room of a forum to talk about the things that we don't agree with in the future so that's basically what the family protocol aims to in this concept of the document um, to creating that uh, we suggest that the elements that we will work with are basically um, time, consensus, and meeting. What does it mean? When we talk about time, we are talking about the timing, the rhythm of the, of the meetings that we have to, to create. If we have few than enough, uh, we probably will have a precipitation of the conclusion that we are going to have. But if we, if we extend the process, uh, we will see that the, the, most of the situations that we, what we started with are going to change and it will be hard to have a definition of the conclusion. So the timing is very important. Uh, and we are talking about process that could last four, five, six months. Um, I won't suggest more than that in a group of, of five to 10 members of a family discussing about the, the, the elements of the policies of the, of the, of the protocol. Yeah. Um, and and we, we should try to, to think that the consensus is the way that uh, a, a family make their own decisions. Uh, it's always better having a consensus that uh, uh, voting for a decision. And, and meetings, we will we will need meetings, um, yeah. presential or virtual. This is not something that only one person can do. Uh, this is a collective work. I don't know, Paul. How 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 is your experience in, in working in charters? In um, on it's interesting, yeah, yeah, because I, I think in terms of what. You, firstly, I'm not an advisor, so I don't actually sit down with families. But but from the families I've talked to around the process they've been to. They get more value from the process of going through it and putting, as you say, the consensus on the framework around some of the trickier conversational points that will be trickier going forward. Um, I think there's an element of the family business community that that it's a it's the process is a process, um, and others that would find out that that there's a it's like these ten things need to go into a family charter, and I think every family is slightly different and the nuances are slightly different. So I think the process for me is really really important. But I think the collective family have to buy into that process. It can't just be driven by one individual. It has to be a the family have to buy into it because it's going to have implications for the family going forward. It can't. I don't think it can be imposed on a, on a business by a by one individual. Um, but I do think you need to have buy in for for for, for more. Um, but the process I think can be incredibly powerful. 
to have those kind of open, honest conversations around things that are tricky. Mm -hmm. From the culture I come from, from from the Latin culture, uh, we uh, we do believe in the documents. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are, we we come from a culture where where the the the, the written word it's more important that that the things that we can tell each other. So uh, when when we think about the document, it's it's very powerful. I mean, I have a protocol. I have this book that we created. And, and it's been a challenge as advisors to teach the families that it's good to have the book, it's good to have the document, but in order to make it sustainable, in order to make it last, we have to go through a process where we are going to have conversations and the document is the conclusion of that conversation. And this is a cultural challenge for us to understand that, that, that way of, um, of, of focus on our, our intentions on, on processes more than in, in products. So I don't know if that's something that you have seen in other cultures, but in our case, I will say that it's very typical. I think that's quite common and it's something I have yeah I've heard before I think it's also I think in our culture it's something that's always been aligned with the larger family firms that the larger family firms have got the need more of a need and I think actually all family firms have a need and the document should reflect just their stage of development and grow with them over time I think actually some of the conversations now would prevent issues occurring down the line because there's a there's a formulated process and a consensus on some of these things so I think it's, it's often been pitched as charter means family business but family business big business multinational multi-generational and i think actually all businesses can take some solace from going through that journey and starting the process early because the document i think evolves over time so i, I think more people should write things down and avoid those misunderstandings and actually this is a great framework for them to do it. <laughs> excellent so um I would like to move forward with the last thoughts about this presentation. Uh, one, of, one of them is, is related with when to draw up uh, the, the, the protocol. Uh, I will say that before a problem arises, uh, yeah. please don't think that um, a protocol will solve your problems. The protocols will prevent the problems or will teach you how to solve the problems, but it doesn't solve by itself. So if you are in a situation of an open conflict, I will suggest not to go through this process, try to solve first the conflict and then move for uh, yeah. a, a documentation like this. Uh, the ideal moment is when the business has been consolidated and several members are committed with the project. I will say that all the families that try to reach an advisor to focus on the family are families with a good business situation. They don't call you when the business is, is having problems because when that happens, the family focus on the business, <laughs> not in, in solving the, the family issues. Yeah. So uh, try to focus on if you have a, a good moment in your business, this, is, this could be a good moment to think in the family uh, charter. Uh, when we find ourselves in a time of unity and harmony without power struggles and with a leadership that helps to reach consensus, which is very important on these conversations, and especially convenient in firms where succession is near, uh, in which members of the next generation have joined or will join, and in which the number of owner relatives is large. For example, in the Cousin Consortiums, I would say that this is almost mandatory that <laughs> you need these kind of, yeah. of documents. So um, the, the content that usually we talk about in these documents are based on a, a preamble when there is the justification of why we are doing this, what's the purpose of doing this. Uh, we define a system of values and principles, duties and rights of the family, governance bodies, employment policies, economic benefit systems, succession, or at least a plan for succession, yeah. social responsibility, how to secure the patrimony and the family. And you only have to leave by the end something that we call the transitional provisions, which are the instructions of, of how are we going to change this document? Because as you mentioned, this, mm -hmm. this kind of instrument have to evolve 
Uh, usually it, it evolves uh, after the family business. So we have to have this valve to create the, the, the right conditions to talk about how to change this, what we have agreed. So it's very important to, to give the flexibility and the, and the value of, of changing to this kind of document. Now, um, I would like to close uh, or dedicate this last minute to make a, a wrap up. I'm thinking on, on what we call the decalogue of power management in the family business. So those are ideas that we've been talking about today. Mm. The first one is that we should understand in order to create our balance point to separate the concept of ownership, governance, and management. Some family business doesn't have that very clear, especially when traveling from first to second generation. It is very important if we want to create the balance point that we have to differentiate one concept from the other. The other one is that the governance structures must to be according to the complexity of the system. We talk about that, make it simpler, but if you are complex, not, don't make it simple. Try to make it complex enough to support your structure. Yeah. Um, for creating all of this, you need a transparent management and a continuous accountability. Creating structures for power uh, doesn't mean create bureaucracy in order to cover uh, a, a leadership that wants to keep on going on the on the on the lead. Uh, all of this is possible because we are moving for a collective uh, mindset, and that requires transparency and accountability. It's the only way to make it possible. Mm -hmm. We have to create the generate the, the concept of stewardship. That's the only way to understand what's your real role in all of the process of creating these structures. We have to improve communication, cultivate the dialogue, and tolerate differences. Every time we, that we move forward in the complexity, we will see more diversity. We will see more complexity in terms of, of differentiation of the different individuals. And we have to understand that. We have to tolerate that there's people that is different from me and from my perspective and from my necessities. So every time that we integrate that in our decision-making process, we will find that this richness of different points of view is something that adds value to the family business. Yeah. We have to be continuing, uh, continuously uh, training as a shareholders, as a, a directors, a member of the board, member of the next generation, uh, um, Coming to these kind of presentations organized by Family Business United is important because you have to be learning every time that you have the chance to. Uh, we have to accept that the conflict will always be present. Um, conflict is a way to understand change. Uh, every time that the, the family comes to me and, and asks me for help them because they don't want to have conflict, I have to say, I'm sorry, but the only thing that I can assure is that you are going to have conflict. But what we can do is learn how to deal with the conflict, which is something different. But we need the conflict in order to evolve as a system. Um, if there is no conflict, that's a problem because it means that you are not evolving. So let's requalify the concept of the conflict because we need it, but we need to be intelligent enough to learn how to deal with that. The other thing is um, you have to have confidence and, and in the judgment of the external advisors. Not all the family members has all the, the, the answers to a complexity like the one they, they face. Uh, inviting uh, externals, external professionals to help you to decide is a, is a good practice that uh, we have to accept because we don't have all the answers. Mm -hmm. We have to accept the definition of institutional retirement, which is if there is an institution that we have created, the person that is in charge won't be in charge forever. There is a succession process that we have to face, but the ones that we have to replace is the person in the charge, in the position. The position remains. And we have to understand that this person is not the position itself. 
and 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 that's what we're looking for. And basically, when we when when we try to draw up a family protocol or a family charter, the concept that the, we have discovered that really works to make it sustainable is working in a shared dream. Once you have defined the dream that you want to share for the future that you need, you will have a, 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 a concept that will help you to make easier the decision maker process of the policies of the protocol. If you don't create that sense of, of purpose of, of this uh, shared dream, it will be hard to understand why you are deciding the policies that you are deciding. So first of all, define where you want to go and why you are to go there. Because once you have that, all the rest of the process of, redact, uh, of writing the policies will be easier. So those are the, the ideas. And there's, there's some fantastic takeaways, some really fantastic takeaways in there. And just, just to get the conversation for families started, um, I mean, you always, every time we do these, these sessions, I always go away with, I mean, I've written pages of notes, I have loads of ideas and, and, and you, you stimulate the mind in a way that's very different. And I think there's lots in there that, that will resonate with people. It will remind people, I think, um, Guillermo, that they know they need to do some of this stuff and they haven't done it and they should start to document some of it and actually put the structures in place. So there's, there's lots of takeaways in there. So as always, um, there's a fountain of knowledge in there, or a mountain of knowledge even, to be fair. Um, and yeah, I, I just have to say thank you for your honesty and also for sharing because actually the community that you're part of and the one that we create is very much about that sharing culture and actually it's it's important that we start the conversation, isn't it? Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that. And I have uh, three final recommendations. Three more, three, 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 three extra, three uh, special gift. Fantastic, yeah. it's a bonus. I would call the golden tips. You have to respect the rituals in order to separate what the family needs and the family and the business needs, the conversations about the family belong in the family and about the firm belong in the firm uh, don't talk about the firm during a wedding or a funeral that in some cases we do that in family business the second um, tip is that we need to create a healthy family what does it mean we have to create family gathering and trips why not uh, getting away from the business habitat generates healthy perspective on the relationships. And it's very important. This is the, the gas that move the family business, healthy relationships among the family. And family, um, we have to learn to exhibit a professional attitude. And being professional means making decisions in an orderly way. It doesn't mean that you have a, a college degree. It means that when you have to face decision process, you have order in that. And when firm issues uh, uh, are to be discussed, please prepare, study in advance and follow the agenda. That's the secret to be professional. And that's it. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. As always, I, I said it before, but it's it's the structure's there and actually it will help the conversations. People have conversations around this, this stuff. I know you're always around on, on, on connections and we're happy to make introductions as and when we can. So if anyone does want to get hold of you, they, they know where to find us and we can put them in touch. Um, all, it, all it remains for me to say is, is thank you for your time, um, investing the time to create the, the, the session that we wanted around power. Power is a very sort of, it's, it's not often talked about, is it? It's one of those concepts that's there and people know all about it, but but it causes issues. So the frameworks that you've prepared today were, were brilliant in terms of documenting that for us and sharing it and, and, and raising the, the questions and starting the conversation. So, and, and if you allow me, I have just published this book. A Road to Triumph in Family Business. It's just uh, about two weeks ago. Most of the things I've been talking today are here in okay. a further situation. So I will make sure um, I, I dig out the link to that after the session and we, we'll share that for you as well. Um, and we'll add it to the, the library on, on the session. So, well, congratulations on the book. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And um, I look forward to catching up with you again soon. And as always, continue doing what you do to help the family business community. It's fantastic. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation. Thanks, okay. okay.